Hey guys welcome back to the channel. This is part 14 of what if Deku built the infinity gauntlet. If you guys enjoy this what if and want to see part 15 of it, comment down below and let me know. Also check out previous parts of this what if. I have created a playlist for this what if where you can find all the previous parts. Link is in the description. And go ahead and check out other what ifs in the channel. Before we start please do support for more awesome content. Don't forget to subscribe and leave a like and also share this video with your friends. So let's start this video. Shigaraki was not happy. Not the least bit with the situation that presented itself today. First the Yakuza was being stubborn and refused to meet with them. They were obviously playing the long game. Something that Sensei taught him, these groups will sometimes put off meetings in order by time, or to make you lose your patience, which in turn would cause you to make a mistake. And on top of all that he had that brat apotheosis here talking to him as if he was a child again. Something that irritated him to no end. Could you repeat that? Tamura said dangerously. It's simple these two wish to join my department, so I'm taking them with me, Izuku shrugged nonchalantly from where he was sitting. You've gotten pretty cocky haven't you kid? Shigaraki sneered at him. That tends to happen when one obtains a vast amount of power, Izuku smirked at the villain. I don't see why you're so upset Dobby and Himiko just want to try out other prospects. You've run out Nomis, and your league is kind of a standstill right now, he told him the blunt truth. You're not doing so well Tomyur. Ever since Sensei was imprisoned the League of Villains hasn't really made much progress other than a few seemingly random attacks here and there, he gestured to the dark-haired fire user and the psychotic blonde. It's not like you're never going to see or use them again. If it helps you can think of them as a liaison between our two organizations. You've got some nerve midori at Tamura Shigaraki glared at him through the fingers of his father's hand. I remember when you were just a scrawny little corkless nobody, helping petty scumbags and bank robbers perform small-time jobs before Sensei and I led into our group. You were nothing before you joined us. Nobody was interested in you, even the police didn't start investigating you until the UA attack, Izuku frowned as he went on this rant. Now you sit there with your little toy and think you can do whatever you want, Shigaraki stood up from his chair. Get out. If I ever see your face again I'll turn you to dust, he spat as he turned to walk away. We're not done here Tomyur, sit down, Izuku said calmly. Shigaraki ignored him, and kept walking away only to freeze, when a powerful force held him in place. I said, the villain was lifted up in the air in front of all his subordinates, and tossed back into the chair he occupied a moment ago. Sit down. Izuku's aura turned dark and menacing before it vanished as quickly as it came, returning to his warm pleasant demeanor, which honestly frightened the members of the league. I don't think we're understanding each other, Izuku remarked. Allow me to explain things, he paused as he looked at the villain across from him with a serious expression. I don't think I made it clear before, but the only reason you and your league still exist is because of all for one. Sensei was kind enough to help me, to give me advice and a place to work in privacy. And because he showed me such kindness towards a quirkless nobody, as you put it, I decided to extend a similar kindness to you his successor Tomura Shigaraki, he then smiled again in that creepy way. Without that I would have crushed the League of Villains by now, and you and your members would be rotting in a cell. I should grateful. Is that what you're saying? Shigaraki spat. No you should feel lucky that I still consider you a friend and look up to all for one as a mentor, Izuku explained. So just be very careful with what you say and do towards me, because this, he gestured to the abandoned warehouse the villains currently occupied. Could all end, if I so desired, he stood up from his chair. Now do we understand each other Tomura Shigaraki? Yeah, I think I get it, Shigaraki growled out. He didn't like it, but his mind started plotting anyway for him to use this to his advantage. At the very least it seemed Midoriya was keen on letting them do as they please for now, but how long would that last? Now more than ever Shigaraki needed to get his hands on that quirk racing weapon that the Yakuza was rumored to have in their possession. Great. Izuku opened a portal. We'll be seeing you then, he smiled as he stepped through. Toga of course didn't hesitate to follow him into it. Dabi however looked at Shigaraki and the rest of the league for a moment. Nothing personal guys, the patched up man said, before stepping into the portal towards his new role. When they were gone Kurigiri who remained silent through the whole altercation finally spoke. I know you don't want me to say it Shigaraki, but we still need his friendship, the misty villain said. He's probably the only thing keeping the heroes off our trail at this point. What does she see in him? Twice murmured to himself, a little upset, that Toga just left with Midoriya. Probably the cute freckles, he was of course ignored. Kurgiri Tamura removed the hand from his face. Tell me about this weapon sensei left for me again. Meanwhile. Welcome to the temporary headquarters, Izuku gestured to the large portable trailer they were currently occupying. Where the hell are we? Dabi asked as he looked at one of the windows and noticed a lot of construction going on outside. An island out in the ocean I created, Izuku told them as he sat down at the desk of his makeshift office. I'm sure you noticed the tremors felt throughout the city recently. That was you. Dabi raised a brow. Oh, he's only getting stronger, Toga gushed. 
This is where the main base of operations will be built, Izuku told them while ignoring the blonde girl's thirsty gaze. It will serve as a home base, a training facility and as a factory for the Titan robots. You still haven't said what you need us for, Dobby noted. Don't get me wrong things seem to be stagnating in the Handman's League, and I'm glad that you offered a better alternative, but why did you recruit us specifically? Izuku merely smiled in response. I want you to because of all the members of the League of Villains, you two were the most reliable and willing to listen to me, the green-haired teen explained. I want you two to work with another agent of mine that I recently recruited. The three of you will be my eyes and ears in the underground world of villainy. I now have my hand on the heroes, but you three will be my black hand on the villains. Izuku needed them to keep the villains in line, while he kept the heroes in line. Now it made sense to Dobby. Apotheosis never liked to leave too much to chance. If he was to succeed in his eventual absolute control over the society of heroes, then he would need control over the dark society of villains too. There were other groups out there besides the League of Villains. Izuku wanted them to basically do the dirty work for him. Not that they had a problem with that. Who is this agent of yours? Dobby asked. Where is he? Himiko asked as she glanced around the office. He's busy, Izuku grinned. I've been idle for a short period, but now while my base is being constructed, I shall bring judgment swiftly down upon the false heroes. These next heroes on my list will serve as an example, just like Endeavor, now Dobby liked the sound of that. Later. City streets. Thank you. You're too kind. Now Lady smiled at the adoring public. She had just successfully pinned down a villain who tried to rob a pharmacy, and after the police took him away, she stuck around for the reporters to take pictures and to sign autographs. It was great being a hero. Ahem. Someone loudly fake coughed behind her. Now Lady turned around in her normal size form to see a tall man dressed in black armor, overcoat, and a strange black featureless mask that covered most of his head, leaving only one opening for his mouth. Now Lady, on behalf of the HRD, you are required to come with me to face evaluation, the mystery man said in a rehearsed fashion. Evaluation? The female hero questioned. Yes evaluation, or sentencing if you prefer, the man repeated. In other words the boss, Director Midoriya, wants to see you. And what does that little boy want with me? Now Lady asked in a mocking tone. You're one of the heroes at the top of his list, she could see his grin through the mouth hole of his mask. You're on the chopping block Mount Lady, so come with me, and face the boss's judgment. Just what sort of authority do you have? Who are you anyway? She demanded. I work for the HRD that's all you need to know, he shot back. Now are you going to come quietly? Please don't, because I have permission from the boss to use force if necessary. Guess who does that little brat think he is? Now Lady didn't like being talked down to especially in public in front of fans and reporters, so she tried to rudely shove the masked man away. That proved to be a big mistake. In one instance the man had dashed behind her with shocking speed. The hero felt a shallow cut on her cheek, and when she spun around the man was holding a combat knife stained with a few drops of her blood. You tried to harm an agent of the HRD, that's really not going to help you case, when you're in front of the boss. The man chuckled darkly as a tongue came out of the mouth hole of his mask to lick the blood. In the next moment Mount Lady suddenly lost control of her body. In front of everybody she collapsed like a puppet, that just got its strings cut. Take her away boys, he ordered to someone she couldn't see from her position on the ground. A large metal foot entered her vision as something growled, and bent down to grab her by the leg. The Titan robot dragged the hero over to an armored truck, where it roughly tossed her into the back, where the two other heroes were sitting not paralyzed as opposed to her, because it seemed they surrendered themselves peacefully unlike her. And that makes three, the man said as he checked off the third hero on the list he was given. Midoriya wanted these three specifically, to make a big show out of. In the same way, that he made a show out of Endeavor's humiliating defeat, and honestly he couldn't wait to watch it. Stepping into the passenger seat of the truck the vehicle quickly sped off leaving a confused and somewhat concerned crowd of fans, who quickly started uploading what just happened to social media. The truck drove for about an hour until it stopped suddenly. By then the paralysis wore off allowing Mount Lady to move and look to see who else was brought in like her. To the left sat the snake hero Uwabami, and across from her sat Jinanachi, also known as the hero meteorologist weather dominator. Before she could ask them about how they the two of them were captured the doors to the armored trunk opened revealing three of those tall scary black robots standing there along with that masked agent. Get out, he ordered. And don't try to run. You won't get far, they could hear the amused grin in his voice. The three pros cautiously stepped out of the vehicle keeping wary eyes and the titan sentries. Looking around they noticed that they were outside the front entrance of the Hero Public Safety Commission central office. Waiting for them at the steps was Izuku Midoriya himself with a line of his robots behind him. The boy smiled as the heroes approached. Cameras were set up around the area, televising this live. Uwabami, Mount Lady, and Weather Dominator do you three know why you are here? Izuku asked the three who chose to remain silent. You're here because the three of you have failed to live up to the idea of what a hero should be. Two of you, he pointed to the women, care more about fame and attention than stopping villains or saving lives. 
You on the other hand, Izuku turned to look at Weather Dominator. You disgust me more than these two combined. Using your court to create localized weather events, so you can report them. Not only that, but extorting agriculturists for money. I don't know what you're talking about. Jin denied such allegations rather quickly. Really? Izuku placed a finger on his cheek. Because you're very wealthy for a low-ranking hero and meteorologist. My mother left me a lot of money when she passed away, Jin quickly restated the excuse he always used. That's interesting considering your mother lives in a retirement home, and is very much alive, Izuku smirked at him as he stepped closer to this corrupt man. You think I didn't do my research on you weather dominator? You changed your last name when you became a hero, so no one looked too deep into your lies, one of the robots handed him a large envelope. Now this is especially interesting, he took out some photos he obtained a while back. Look at that it's you taking bribes from various agricultural businesses. Apparently you use your quirk, so the crops get enough rain to grow, and the ones that refuse to give you money, you use your quirk to ruin their crops, and destroy their business. He showed the cameras the incriminating photos so the whole world could see. Jin you didn't. You Obami said shock evident on her face. But like you're one to talk you pompous media whore. Jin snapped at her. You know you'd be surprised what people who have been oppressed will tell you when you extend a helping hand and a promise to end their troubles. Izuku confessed to where he originally got this information. A simple visit to these business owners and a few hidden cameras was all it took to expose this man's crimes. Jinanachi, you have been judged guilty of being a false hero and gross misuse of your quirk. Izuku flash warped forward before the man had a chance to react and grabbed his face with the gauntlet. Purple veins spread across his face and body as the hero screamed in pain as his quirk was extracted. The green-haired teen released him, when it was over letting his unconscious body collapse like a ragdoll. The two female pros watched in horror at what just happened. Iwabami quickly realized that they were next, and quickly tried to talk her way out of this. Now I know what you must think of me, but I, the snake hero was cut off when a metal gauntlet covered her mouth. Nope. No excuses, Izuku said as he silenced her. You're just a celebrity not a hero, so what I'm about to do is completely justifiable. He activated the soul stone as the woman's screams were muffled by the device covering her mouth. At least you have your modeling career to fall back on, he scoffed as the snakes in her hair disappeared as her quirk was forcibly taken. After she fell to the ground green eyes turned to the last one left. In a panic mount lady tried to run only to block by a line of robots and the masked man. That hesitation cost her everything as Izuku warped behind her. Don't think because you're a new hero that you'll be given mercy, the director spoke. You just started and you already think you're some kind of star. It's a shame, that hero school you went to didn't do anything to curb that ego, but then again none of them seemed to do that, without hesitation he reached out, and grabbed the back of her head. It was over in seconds and she too was tossed to the ground like the other two. Izuku then turned and looked to one of the cameras, he raised his hand, and pointed directly at it. You next, that was his warning to all the other corrupt and false heroes, that he was coming for them before the cameras cut out. Wow, the masked man applauded. You know I think I like your method better than mine, he chuckled. I told you it will be a far better punishment to have to live as quirkless nobodies for the rest of their lives, than to simply die, Izuku smiled at him. Live with the shame, rather than die as victims to your crusade is so much better isn't it stain? The man took off his masked helmet to reveal the hero killer himself. I think I miss the groveling they usually do before they die, Stain said as he looked at the three unconscious bodies with disgust. But we're just getting started, the wielder of the gauntlet, told him while creating a portal for them. Come now, would you like to meet the two people you'll be working with? They're both big fans of your work, he gestured to the portal. Todoroki hassled. Shoto, dinner's ready, Fayumi said from the doorway of her brother's room. Shoto took one last look at the black card that came in the mail this Saturday morning addressed to him, before pocketing it to think about later. Father decided to join us and Natsuo is here too, she sounded nervous. Shoto nodded and followed his older sister to the dining room. Lately Enji Todoroki had kept quietly to himself. He probably had a lot to think about. What with losing his hero license, agency, the population's respect and his quirk in one fell swoop. Shoto walked in and his father's eyes immediately zeroed in on him for a brief moment. The hot and cold boy sat down at the opposite end of the table, while his sister Fayumi sat to the left, while Natsuo sat on the right as they usually did during these weekend dinners. The Todoroki family ate in silence. So how's your work-study program going? Fayumi asked to break the awkward quietness. It's going fine, Shoto responded quietly. Seeing that there wasn't much conversation to be had there she turned to her father. How have you been father? Fayumi realized that was probably the wrong thing to ask as she asked it. I lost my quirk how the hell do you think I feel, Enji practically snarled at her. It seemed he was still quick to anger, that hadn't changed yet. Do not talk to her that way, Shoto glared at his father, letting a few embers emerge from between his fingers. Father and son stared each other down until the quiet snickering of Natsuo interrupted. What's so funny? The former hero snapped at his other son. It's just you called the three of us failures, but in the end you're the biggest failure of all, Natsuo mocked. 
And now you're whining about being crookless, as if it's the end of the world. I will not be talked down to by a brat who couldn't even cut it as a hero, and she growled at him. Says the guy that got his ass handed to him by a group of robots, Natsuo fired back. But the true irony is that it was a quickless kit that took everything you cared about. I only wish Tuya was alive to see it, he hated you more than anyone, and you slammed his fist into the table, wishing he still had his court to put this brat in his place. His meal was suddenly frozen over stopping whatever Rand was about to leave his mouth. Following the trail of ice it lead to the other end of the table where Shoto was silently eating his soba, while keeping his bi-colored eyes locked onto his father's. Calm down, Shoto finally said, after he finished eating. If you can't handle some harsh criticisms then Midoriya was right to rob you of your quirk and hero status. You agree with that punk, the former hero snapped at his son. Yeah. I wasn't sure about his methods, but they are getting good results, Shoto said boldly. You never deserve to be a hero. You only care about yourself and your ranking, his father was fuming at him now. Midoriya was right, you should have stopped caring about this feud with All Might. You should have just been a hero, and been content with that, because it doesn't matter in the end, if you're the best. Having finished his meal, and said his piece he stood up from the table and left the dining room. Natsuo looked at his younger brother with pride having stood up to the bastard, while Fayumi looked at him with concern. The woman stood up from her seat bowing apologetically to her family and followed after him. Shoto. Fayumi walked into his room, to see him staring at a black business card in his hand. I'm going away for a while Fayumi, Shoto suddenly spoke. I've been offered a position in a new hero program and I've decided to take it. Just please make sure you do what you think is right, Shoto turned to face his older sister. Whatever it is you plan to do. I will, he said quietly, while turning to look at the letter that came with the card. A logo at the top resembling a closed armored fist with an I in the center and the letters H, R, and D at the bottom. Shoto Todoroki. You've been invited to join the new hero regulation department. I believe you'll make an excellent addition to the elite team bent on correcting this flawed hero society. As you probably imagine there are more people like Endeavor out there. People who like him don't take the role seriously and see it as a path to fame, glory, or wealth. I would like you and others to serve as an example of what a true hero should be. In the department you will be given exclusive training and benefits to help you become that hero. The offer is all yours, you can accept it or continue the slow trudge to heroism that UA offers. I think you have great potential Shoto, and I want to help you reach it. Call the number on the card if you wish to join. Izuku Midoriya, Director of the HRD. P.S. There is no time frame attached to the offer. My door is always open for you. The youngest Todoroki took a deep breath. He wanted to do this. He needed to do this. Midoriya understood what was wrong with the world, and now had the power to fix it. Midoriya wanted real heroes and the real hero is what Shoto wanted to be. But could he trust Midoriya? That was the question. He had been thinking lately over everything that the dark green haired teen had done. He built a device that gave him nearly limitless power, so people will listen to him and take him seriously. He exposed the truth about All Might, beginning the process of people letting go of this ridiculous fake standard that the number hero represented. He then strong-armed the Prime Minister into legalizing the purging of false heroes in the form of his hero regulation department. Shoto had already heard the news concerning the three pro heroes and what happened. So it seemed that Midoriya was honestly trying to fix the problems using extreme methods, but so far it looked like it was working. With his mind made up Shoto Todoroki pulled out his phone and called the number on the card. Iraka. Izuku called from his temporary office. Can you bring me the file 11c? He asked politely. Sure, Echeko sifted through the folders on her own desk until he found the right one and walked into his office to hand it to him. Thank you, Izuku sat there with his jacket off and sleeves rolled up. His gauntlet of course was always on. Do you ever take that gauntlet off? The girl suddenly asked. It's just I always see you wearing it. Of course I don't take it off, Izuku frowned. Do you realize what they would do to me if I ever removed this? He waved his armored device at her. So how do you keep your arm clean? Izuku sighed at her question. There's a hydration and disinfecting mechanism built inside, he told her with complete seriousness. I thought of everything. Alright, Echeko grossed herself out imagining if he didn't have an internal cleaning method built into his invention. Damn these people are stubborn, Izuku cursed as he read the forms he submitted. Rejected again. What are you trying to do this time? The gravity girl asked. Well I'm trying to have a ban put on hero merchandise, Izuku replied. All it does is further glamorize the hero profession, and put money in the pockets of their agencies and the corporations that back them. That seems appropriate and fair, Yuraka thought about, and that would be a good idea. They really shouldn't be encouraging children into these jobs without them fully understanding what they're getting into. It was all part of Izuku's plan to get people, to be heroes for the right reason, and not become celebrities. Yes, because at the end of the day pro heroes are really nothing more than public servants, Izuku scowled. Where are the firefighter figures, or the police chief t-shirt, or hell where's the action figure of me? This is a job not a marketing platform, he sighed in exasperation. Getting himself worked up again wouldn't help any. 
Some people in the Senate are obviously in bed financially with some of these companies. I just have to weed them out. Well when we get our own office building and more staff this department can get more done, Achako smiled pleasantly. Thank you again Izuku for hiring my parents construction business. It's nothing, I needed someone to build our branch office in the city, while well, the fortress was handled by a different more private construction company, Izuku told her. The that has made this job well help my family out immensely, and I um, just wanted to, Yuraka blushed brightly, and stepped around his desk. She quickly leaned down, and gave him a quick peck on the cheek. Izuku's green eyes widened as his own face turned red. He placed a hand on the spot she just kissed. Thank you. You're welcome, he cleared his throat quickly and repeated. You're welcome, that was a little bit of the old him still in there somewhere. Anyway come look at this, he gestured to another folder on his desk. Achako opened it up and read it. Yeah that's not good, what she was reading was a rather slanderous article that someone wrote condemning Izuku's actions lately. Actually I think it's funny, he smirked. Just a bunch of sad rambling idiots that are afraid of change. Well you did take down two popular heroes recently. And we're better off without them. Look at this, he pointed to his computers where documents were open. Look how many heroes are getting their act together just to avoid being publicly humiliated and stripped of their quirk and status. The numbers showed the average of pro heroes that were working harder than ever. My method is working, yet these fools are acting like I'm committing murder. Maybe you should do an interview. The brown haired girl offered. I think my actions should speak for themselves, but maybe you're right, Izuku thought about. Maybe if people had it explained they could perhaps understand. We need to find a media outlet that's fair to guests and won't try to persecute on live television, she thought about it while he groaned in annoyance. Going on some talk show was something he'd rather avoid, but maybe he could have it work in his favor. Yay, dorms. According to the former heroes you will bomb me and Mount Lady, the two heroes have apparently lost their quirk after their encounter with director Midoriya, Yuyurosa read from one of the articles that have been circulating lately. The young director has yet to comment on exactly how he's able to remove the quirks from people. You don't think he'd do something like that to a student do you? Mina asked with concern. If a guy could take away the quirks of heroes he didn't like, then what about them? I bet he was going to do that to Bakugo, that day he came here, Jiro commented. Luckily Aizawa sensei pulled him away. That's what the hell is his problem anyway. The pink girl scowled. I get it, he was picked on and bullied for being quirkless, but that's no excuse to being a monster to those that had nothing to do with it. In other worlds this is all Bakugo's fault, so you supplied. That's not what I'm saying, Mino argued. Kirishima backed me up here, you talked to Bakugo about this right. Kirishima snapped to attention before dropping his normally positive demeanor. Actually I haven't talked to him since Midoriya came to visit, he sighed dejectedly. How do you talk to guy that you used to think only acted like an asshole when you find out that he actually is an asshole? Well we at least need to get his side of the story before we make accusations, Mina said. What side? He picked on a defenseless person, so he's clearly in the wrong. I'm not sure I want anything to do with him anymore, the spiky redhead argued back. Well we need to know the full story. Mina raised her voice. How about you go talk to him? You get his side of the story. Kirishima was getting rather angry now at her persistence. Stop yelling, Aizawa walked into the living area on his way out the door. I've been called away. I'll be back, so don't start a fight while I'm gone, he said before he exited the building. The students remained silent a bit before the pink girl spoke again. I can't, Mina finally said. If he really beat up a quirkless person for no reason what do you think he'll do to one of us if we stand up to him? You're afraid? Kirishima noticed. Of Bakugo. Yes. Yes I am, the acid girl admitted. UA principal's office. We think we found something, Nezu began his explanation. We noticed a usual amount of robots at this shipping yard, so I did a little digging. What did you find? Tashinori asked. The principal grinned with hope. Izuku Midoriya is a genius, he created a device meant to be used against his gauntlet, Nezu said excitedly. No way. Even Tashinori was ecstatic to hear that. There was a way to physically beat him after all. There was hope. Yeah apparently he built this thing in secret in case the infinity gauntlet was ever removed and used against him. A friend in the senate who has access to classified files, slipped me a secret document that Midoriya wanted destroyed, the principal pulled out a copy to hand to him. He calls it the anti-gauntlet, according to the file its purpose is to absorb the energy from the stones and render the infinity gauntlet powerless. How would we get our hands on it? Aizawa asked. That's the part you're not going to like Shota Aizawa, Nezu sighed. Let me guess, one of my students is going to be put in danger again. The homeroom teacher glared painfully. Not likely. We just need him to get in, get the device and get out while we provide the distraction, Nezu told him. Who were you considering? Tashinori asked. Training room. Die. Katsuki blasted another boulder to bits. He had tried booking this training time with shitty hair, since he could physical absorb the damage of his explosion, but Kirishima wasn't talking to him anymore. In fact no one in his class wanted anything to do with him anymore. 
Even Kaminari, Sero, and Ashida were avoiding him lately. On top of all that he had been forced to regularly attend counseling to help control his anger. He still seemed pretty angry to me Koch-chan, that mocking voice spoke. He had yet to tell Hound Dog of this hallucination of Deku that wouldn't go away. Still practicing for your provisional license remedial class. The last thing society needs is you out there on the streets fighting crime. You are and always will be a danger to innocent lives, Deku said appearing before him still in the appearance of how he looked at the junkyard. I know better than anyone how dangerous you really are, and now your classmates know it too. I don't give a shit what they think. Kazuki snapped at the image his mind conjured. Ah but you do, Izuku smirked. How can you be the best, if everyone ignores you? How will you get that attention, and praise you crave so badly? Kazuki glared at this imaginary manifestation. You care about what they think of you. You care very badly, what everyone thinks of you. Before he could continue to argue with this hallucination his teacher walked into the training. We leave in 30 minutes get changed and meet me in front of the school, Aizawa said blandly as he turned back around and left as quickly as he came. Kazuki slumped his shoulders and headed towards the locker room ready to face whatever his punishment would be. After he was clean and dressed he made his way to the front entrance where Eraser Head was waiting patiently for him. The man gestured to the car and Kazuki got in without a word. They drove through the city in silence. Both of them obviously preferred it that way to be honest. After half an hour they arrived at what looked like some kind of hospital or health center. Are you going to tell me, what I'll be doing here? Bakugo asked gruffly. You'll see when we get inside, Aizawa said equally gruff. Gesturing for him to follow they made their way inside. Inside the lobby a woman, clearly a doctor going by the white coat, was there to greet them. Ah Aizawa glad you could make it, the woman greeted. Bakugo this is Dr. Higurashi, the woman smiled pleasantly at the blonde. She was an average heighted woman with dark brown hair tied in a bun and round black rimmed glasses on her face. You'll be working with her today. Your principal has informed me of why you are here, the woman frowned lightly. You may see this as a punishment, but I hope you'll come to see this more as an opportunity. She regained her smile as she led the two of them into the facility. I still don't know what it is you want me to do, Bakugo stared forward, while they walked through the clean halls. You see young man this facility takes in special children, the doctor explained. We care for them, teach them, and help them in any way that we can, she paused before she explained the next part. Most of these children are young, but have had hard lives. Some were abandoned, born into abusive homes, or suffered at the hands of others. They walked into an observation room which contained a large one-way mirror, that looked in on a classroom filled with small kids around ages 5, 6, or 7. Tell him the most important part, Aizawa said as he looked through the window. The kids you will be assisting me with, Dr. Higurashi began. A quirkless, Bakugo's eyes widened to ridiculous proportions as he turned his gaze from the woman to the class full of quirkless children. There are some rules you must abide by Bakugo, Azawa began while ignoring the teen's look of shock. When you're not allowed to yell at the children, or physically harm them, the teacher paused for a moment. Also you're not allowed to use your quirk around them, that was actually one of the doctor's rules. The children are already struggling with depression, so best not remind them of what they don't have. How long do I have to do this? Katsuki swallowed nervously. As long as it takes, Aizawa said dryly. UA Development Studio. That's mine, Mei Hatsume placed another of her personal tools in the box. That's mine, she grabbed some of her blueprints. That's mine another set of tools. I brought this from home, she unplugged the coffee machine, and placed it in another box. Hatsume, power loader tried to get her attention. Hatsume. He yelled this time making her stop and turn to him. Are you sure about this? I handed in my forms to the administration so yeah I am absolutely sure, Mei said excitedly. This is why I wanted to attend UA in the first place to invent things for heroes. By joining up with Izuku Midoriya. Power Loader couldn't wrap his head around how she thought allying herself with that guy would allow her to accomplish her goals. Thus the other day his students suddenly handed in her resignation or dropout papers to the principal, much to the shock of her teachers and the school staff. When asked why she simply said that she was offered a position in Midoriya's hero regulation department. Mei, that boy is crazy, how could she not see that? Crazy. Mei seemed offended by that. So just because he has big ideas and big goals he must be crazy. She slammed the box closed and turned around with a huff. Midoriya wasn't crazy, he was simply very ambitious. Thank you for everything sensei, but I need to follow my own path, Mei said before walking quickly out of the workshop. I just hope you realize what you're getting into before it's too late, Power Loader spoke quietly to the empty room. Part of him was glad that the studio wouldn't be blown up every other day, but another part of him would miss the girl and her antics. Mei Hatsume was definitely the most interesting student that he's had in a long time. Three days later, as everyone in position, Azawa spoke into his mouthpiece. Yes, multiple voices repeated. Good. I'm going over the plan one last time, the underground hero began. Nezu has hacked the camera feed of the shipping yard, so Midoriya will have no idea who was here today, so don't worry too much about being spotted. He heard the principal confirm his part of the plan through the headset. 
I'm going to go in with a disguise to distract the robots. Better they come after me than our unfortunate volunteer, he stressed that last part with great concern. This was the part of the plan that he hated. He turned to look at the student that stood beside him waiting for the plan to begin. Ida, as soon as the robots leave the area you dash in. You're looking for a large metal shipping container labeled 56. Tania was chosen for this job, as the agency that he was involved in for his work study was right down the street from the shipping yard. It was the perfect alibi, and Midoriya would never suspect a UA student would take his device. It was almost too perfect of a plan. Something Aizawa felt uneasy about. There should be something in there that looks similar to Midoriya's gauntlet. Simply get it and get out. Do you understand Iida? I've got it Aizawa sensei, the class rep confirmed. Remember if something happens, or if something doesn't seem right I don't care about the device I want you to get out of there immediately, the underground hero warned. It's not worth your safety or life, do you understand? He said sternly. I understand, Ida nodded as he put his helmet on and walked out of the alley to get into position. I swear if something bad happens to him Nezu, Azawa threatened his boss. Everything will be fine, Nezu's voice assured him. We planned this out perfectly. Then why do I still feel sick to my stomach? The underground hero still couldn't shake the feeling that something was wrong about this whole situation. This was what they were looking for though, a mistake on Midoriya's part. All villains even the smart ones make mistakes at some point, but Midoriya was more than just a smart villain. Don't start the diversion until the interview begins, the principal reminded him while ignoring the man's worries. Currently an interview was about to go live featuring the wielder of the Infinity Gauntlet himself. They decided to use the time that Izuku was on the air to swipe this anti-gauntlet right out from under his nose while he was busy answering questions. Even with his warping abilities he wouldn't just suddenly leave the interview, at least according to the psychological profile that Nezu did on him. I have the channel on, it will start in few minutes as I will place the helmet over his head that would keep his face and identity hidden. He was wearing a dark jumpsuit that was very different than his normal costume and lacked his patented capture scarf. There couldn't be anything that would leave him recognizable. It's starting go. Hello my name is Shino Ryunasuke of J News Nightly, and today we have a very exciting interview. A man with green skin and dragon-like horns sticking out of his head spoke with joy. Director Midoriya, the young head of the government's new hero regulation department has agreed to come on and speak to us about his recent actions. He paused before looking to the left of the stage. Please welcome Izuku Midoriya. The camera panned over to reveal said teenager standing there in all his glory, wearing his press gray suit and gauntlet still secured to his left hand. Good afternoon Ryunasuke, Izuku greeted him with a smile, reaching out with his right hand to shake the man's offered one. He took a seat across from the interviewer after introductions were out of the way. So let's begin. You were hired by the Prime Minister over a month ago to be the director of the Hero Regulation Department or HRD as it's taken to being called. The man tried to avoid the awkwardness of talking to a teenager, as if he was an adult, but it was obvious. Yes that is correct, Izuku nodded. So what is the purpose of this department? What does it do? Ryunasuke asked. Our job is simple. To regulate and reform the hero profession, Izuku explained. Removing heroes that don't fit the new standards and elevating those that do. I think I speak for most of the population when I say we understand Endeavor and Weather Dominator. After what they've done, but why you Ubami and Mount Lady? I don't think they deserved what they got. That's interesting that you can't see how those two women grossly misrepresented what it means to be a hero, Izuku remarked with amusement. Those two cared more about their popularity than they did doing their job. Last I checked, being a hero isn't the same as being a celebrity. You may have a point, but the interviewer was cut off. No I do make a point. That's what I'm doing, is making a point, Izuku said a bit harshly. But removing a person's quirk. Don't you think that's a harsh punishment? Ryunasuke questioned. You know I'm actually quirkless, the teen supplied. You make it sound like being quirkless is some kind of torture. Is that what you think, being quirkless is like? Who is that man in the mask that works for you? Ryunasuke quickly changed the subject to avoid answering the question. Which Izuku picked up on. That is a special agent of mine. His identity is classified, the gauntlet user explained. He secretly keeps an eye on the heroes for me, and brings me information that they would normally keep quiet about, Izuku smiled. For example, the amount of property damage caused by Mountain. Lady whenever she uses her quirk in public or the fact that Yuubami makes millions of dollars off her products and modeling. That's common knowledge, you're just exacerbating things people already know for your own benefit, the interviewer accused. Really? Common knowledge you say? Is that why the agencies use money and influence to keep these facts out of the media, Izuku accused right back. In fact, anything that would make these people seem less heroic seems purposely kept out of the news. I think you're just assuming things without any proof Ryunasuke said thinking he had him on the ropes. Is it not true that you are attempting to ban hero merchandise? He suddenly asked changing the subject and shifting the focus once again to try and make the boy look bad. Yes I am, Izuku smirked seeing the game the man was playing, but unlike Ryunasuke he had a secret weapon. 
I think it's ridiculous that public servants have action figures and t-shirts. All the merchandise only further glamorizes the profession of heroism and misrepresents what it means to be a hero. But if this law gets put into effect you'll hurt a lot of corporations and hero agencies, a man added. I'm sorry I thought heroes were meant to protect civilians not their corporate backers, Izuku fired back. Speaking of backers and dirty money, the boy smirked whiter as he reached around his chair and pulled out an envelope. Remember when you said removing a hero's quirk was a harsh punishment? Well in the case of Mount Lady and the Snake Hero, I gave them the option of earning their quirks back by telling them to donate their time and energy to charity or perhaps community service. I even attempted to put them in contact with the wellness center that takes in depressed quirkless children that I've been financially supporting for quite some time. He had taken the leftover money he had after he finished his gauntlet from his time as a villain and donated it to the program. Dr. Higurashi was very grateful for said donation and when asked for his name, he just told her to call him Deku. It was the first name that came to mind. Those two women have yet to do anything of the sort and have instead used their time, money and influence to start a smear campaign against me. Well what would you expect when you're the one who, Izuku cut the man off. They have paid to have articles written condemning me for my actions and they even paid off a certain reporter to steer this interview in a way that paints me in a bad light. Isn't that right Shino Ryunasuke? That's not true, the man denied. We have a thing called integrity here at J News, Izuku simply opened the envelope and pulled out largely printed photographs of Uobami and Mount Lady discussing things in a green room with Ryunasuke, and then a picture of them handing the man untraceable cash. I'm sorry, what were you lying about? Izuku cocked his head in a core fashion. My agent is very good at what he does isn't he? He had purposely had Stain spy on them, having a good idea of what they were up to. That was the whole reason he agreed to this interview in the first place. Let's uh, let's cut to a commercial, the interviewer was sweating now. Nope. Keep rolling. Izuku bellied those orders with his own. The camera operators were more afraid of Midoriya than they were of losing their jobs, so they kept going like he said. Don't you think the people should know that, not only are their heroes corrupt, but their media heads are also just as corrupt and self-serving? The dragon-faced man remained silent. Now then I'm going to say what I came here to say, Izuku turned to the camera. All I'm trying to do, is to give the people heroes that they deserve. Not some pompous celebrities or monsters that abuse their quirks and status for personal gain, Ryunasuke was completely ignored now as Izuku pointed his index finger at the camera. This is your fault all of you who let the hero profession rot, and become what it is today. If anyone has a problem with my methods and wants someone to blame, simply look in a mirror. Meanwhile, as soon as the interview started Aizawa put on his disguise and started to move towards the shipping yard. He spotted the tall black imposing titans guarding the front entrance. Honestly for a genius Midoriya was incredibly stupid sometimes. The fact that he had robots guarding this yard was like putting a big sign out that there was something important hidden here. It still seemed too good to be true to erase your head though. With a long overhand toss he threw a cluster of smoke grenades at the machines. The robots turned their heads tracking where the grenades came from until they spotted him. With a growl the titans began stomping towards him. Aizawa turned and hand towards a nearby building, tossing more smoke bombs behind him to keep their full attention. Using a grappling gun to reach the roof quickly, the robots promptly followed by climbing the side. Eat now, he ordered into his communicator. The boy quickly ran towards the unprotected gates, and with his engines propelling him forward took a big leap over it. Dashing through the shipping yard Iida's eyes scanned left to right searching for the container labeled 56. He noticed a surprising lack of robots inside the yard, but he didn't have time to ponder that for long as he was on a time limit. There it is, Iida finally found the one he was looking for. A dark green metal shipping container with the correct number on the side. Glancing around for any possible guards or titans he quickly made his way to it. Pulling the levers, he opened the container and finally saw what they sought. The glass container containing a platinum gauntlet similar to Midoriya's, but the stones were blank and colorless. Ida walked into the container, never noticing the portal that formed in the air above it. Opening the surprisingly unlocked case he reached in and grabbed the device. Ida have you found it yet? Aizawa asked though the communicator. Yeah I have it, the class rep responded. Good, get out there now, the teacher ordered. Suddenly the communication was cut and Ida nearly fell over when something lifted the container he was in up into the air. Ida. Ida. Shota Aizawa shouted into his mic. He had safely escaped the robots by hiding atop a different building that overlooked the shipping yard. With a pair of binoculars he was able to see what was happening. The shipping container that his student was inside of was being lifted into the air by a telekinetic force and pulled into a portal. What the hell is going on? Nezuyu said Midoriya wouldn't notice until it was too late. I don't understand the interview is still going on live unless the principal suddenly realize that they were deceived from the very beginning of this plan. Elsewhere. Ida panicked as he felt the container suddenly land on solid ground. He clutched the gauntlet to his chest protectively, as it was their only hope at defeating Midoriya. Tania Ida, would you mind stepping out of there? A familiar voice called. 
The young man held the gauntlet tightly as he reopened the doors of the shipping container and walked out. He was no longer in the yard, the container was moved to a whole new location. A large high ceiling conference room with a long table in the center. At the head of it sat Izuku Midoriya with his fingers interlocked together, and to his right occupying two of the chairs sat Ichako Yuraka and Shoto Todoroki. While Iida wasn't surprised to see Yuraka here, Todoroki was a huge shock. You're just in time for the end of the show, Izuku smiled and grabbed a remote control. It was then that Iida noticed the large monitor screen above and behind Midoriya, playing the interview that was supposed to be live. He spun around in his chair to watch the rest. The Prime Minister gave me full authority to deal with corrupt heroes any way I see fit. Soon you all will see that this is all for the better, the Izuku on the television paused before finishing his speech. But until then I don't think you've all been properly made aware of how bad the heroes of today really are, so starting tomorrow I'll be bringing to light all the dirty secrets the Hero Public Safety Commission tried to keep out of the media. The real Izuku flipped the screen off before turning back around in his chair to face Ida. I bet you confuse, Midoriya cocked his head. The interview was never live was it? The class rep was finally starting to put the pieces together. This was a trap. We filmed it yesterday, and I ordered the J News to not air till the next day, and claimed that it was live. Izuku noticed the death grip that Iida had on the anti-gauntlet. Will you let that thing go already? Using the reality stone's power he ripped the gauntlet out of the other boy's hands, and slowly crumpled it into a bowl. Aluminum and plastic rocks, any kid with a decent allowance, could buy these materials at your local craft store. He tossed what he now revealed, as nothing more than a crumpled prop behind him. I mean come on. Did you really think I would build a device that could be used against my infinity gauntlet? Iida's eyes widened further as he took a cautious step backwards. I purposely planted false information for Nezu and set up the hook and bait at that specific location close to your internship, because I knew they would use you, while someone else provided the distraction. Izuku revealed the workings of his elaborate trap. Why? Why would you bring me here? Iida's eyes went from Izuku to Yuraka who looked back at him with concern, and then to Shoto who looked apathetic. To talk, he gestured towards the seat next to Todoroki. Seeing that this was all a trap from the start, and he probably wouldn't get far if he ran to Nia decided to cooperate by sitting down and removing his helmet. At least until he found a way out of this. Relax no one is going to get hurt here. After this meeting is over you'll be returned to the city safely. Ida is here now, so can we begin? Todoroki asked with a small amount of impatience. Soon, we're just waiting on three more people, Izuku supplied. The group heard a noise coming from a set of double doors on the left side of the room. Ah, that should be them now, the doors swing open, first revealing a grinning blonde girl named Toga Himiko, then another known member of the League of Villains called Dobby walked in behind her. The patched up man's eyes widened for a brief moment when he spotted the Todoroki boy before writing himself, an action that didn't go unnoticed by the dual cork wielder. It was the third individual that had Iida standing up out of his chair. The hero killer staying in the flesh and looking as murderous as ever. What is this? Tania demanded. Shoto remained calmed, but he too wanted to know. The only one not curious was Yuraka for she was already told of the plan, and knew ahead of time who would be joining them. Sit down Iida, Izuku ordered calmly. There will be no fighting here, and if it starts I won't hesitate to end it. Trust me when I say you don't want that, he threatened. Iida glared at him, but slowly complied by returning to his seat without another word. Izuku smiled at him then turned to the three newcomers. Now if you three would be kind enough to also take a seat so we can begin. Toga of course immediately took a seat to Midoriya's immediate left, directly across from Ichako. Dabi sat down next across from Todoroki, and Stain sat parallel to Iida, not the least bit intimidated by the boy glaring daggers at him. Now then let's begin, Izuku clapped his hands gaining their attention. I'll keep this simple. The reason I've called you six here is because I've chosen you to be the first of the enforcers for my new department. I'm calling it the Knights of Balance, the main purpose of course being to restore balance to the world of heroes. The secondary purpose is of course, to serve as examples of what heroes should be, and that is where you three come in, he pointed to the three on his right. I think you three have the potential to be true heroes, and I want to help get you there with exclusive training, promotion and better gear, than what you eight could provide. And what exactly do you need them for? Shoto asks while eyeing the three villains. I need them to keep the villains of society in line during this transition, Izuku sighed. Look I'm not stupid. There are more villain groups out there, and I don't expect them to remain idle, while I slowly take apart and put back together our messed up hero system. In fact I bet some of them even preferred the corruption, and will probably attempt to throw a wrench or two in my plans, so Stain, Dobby, and Toga will work from the shadows of society, and bring these villains down from the inside. Don't worry I've ordered them not to kill anyone, and that goes double to our former hero killer here, he leveled Stain with a look, and the man scowled in displeasure, but didn't protest. While they are busy, I want you three to become the faces of the HRD, he smiled warmly at his would-be knights. The first of a new generation of heroes. You already have our answer, Yuraka told him while Shoto nodded in agreement. 
They were both ready and willing to help give rise to the new standard of heroes. The only one who wasn't convinced was Tania. How can someone like you create a better hero system? Iida argued. What gives you the right? It's not about whether or not I have the right. I'm the only one who can fix it, because I'm the only one with the will to act, the gauntlet wielder scowled at him. If it wasn't for me everyone would have remained blind to the problem, and the corruption until it grew so bad, that there would be no fixing it. Sometimes when a forest grows sick it must be burned down to give rise to new life. Tell me Tini Iida would you prefer the corrupt hero system to the better one I want to create? You'll have to forgive me Midoriya. Iida glared at him through his glasses. But the only corruption I see, is here in this room. He leveled each person in the meeting room with an equal sharp gaze, before sliding back in his chair. If that's all I think I'll take my leave, without another word he quietly and respectfully left through another set of doors. Yuraka was about to chase after him, but Izuku stopped her. Let him go, the green-haired teen told her. He doesn't know he's on an island and can't leave on his own, he chuckled lightly. Feel free to talk amongst yourselves I'll be back in a few minutes, Izuku stood up, and opened a portal behind him, that he vanished through leaving the five of them in a very awkward silence. Outside. Ida wondered the building and construction zones passing by more robots than actual workmen who were all too busy to tell him where the exit was. He had trouble navigating his way around the labyrinth of corridors, and briefly wondered if he should just use his court to sprint around until he found the exit. His train of thought ended when a portal opened in front of him, and out stepped Midoriya holding a digital tablet. You look a little lost, Izuku smiled waving him over. Come. Let's take a walk, and I'll send you home after. Ida didn't want to rely on him, or have to spend any more time near this person, but without knowing where he was exactly he had no other option. Following the other boy Ida remained silent while he talked about the base that was still being constructed around them. We just finished the main building yesterday, by morning the labs will be done I'm sure Hatsume will be pleased to hear that when she arrives, Izuku continued to chat away, as if he was conversing with a friend. I'm hoping by later this week the training facility and robot factory can be completed, and I can finally cut the red ribbon on our new base. You mean your base, Ida corrected. I like to think of it more as a home. It's always good to have a home, a place to belong. Don't you think? Izuku asked. Living a life without purpose or a place to belong, can you image what that must feel like? Why are you doing this? Ida snapped at him. I'm trying to put you in my shoes, make you see things from my perspective, Izuku explained. You come a long way, since I saved you from stain, but you're not quite there yet. What do you mean I'm not there yet? Tani raised a brow at the other boy's words. You're so close to seeing the world as I see it, Izuku calmly walked around him. You've already seen the way I expose to all might and endeavor. I've brought all the lies of this hero society to light, and now I'm trying to reform it into what it should have been all along. All you need to do, is just see it, and acknowledge it for yourself. What if I can't see it? Or more accurately what if he didn't want to see it? You already did see it, you just chose to ignore it like most people do. Izuku smiled and held out his digital tablet screen. So how's your brother doing? He suddenly asked as if to seemingly change the subject. Leave him out of this. Iida fumed. It must be terrible to watch your once wonderfully heroic brother reduced to a wheelchair, Izuku sighed sadly. Poor Ingenium, the once incredible fast turbo hero now had just slug on wheels. He saw it coming, and could have done any number of things, to stop the punch headed towards his face, but let it happen instead. Iida's fist met Midoriya's cheek and nearly sent him tumbling back. Luckily Izuku had enough grace and poise to keep his feet firmly on the ground. How dare you talk about him like that? Iida shouted as his body shook with rage. If you just listened for a moment you would hear the point I'm trying to make, the godlet user wiped the blood from his lip with his thumb, not even bothering to heal such minor wound. Did you know your brother didn't have to be confined to a wheelchair? Seeing the look on Tania's face, he concluded that his brother must not have told him. Yes he was offered an experimental treatment that would at least give him back the ability to walk, Izuku showed him the tablet screen revealing files, documents, and schematics of a set of exo legs designed to be fitted to his brother's lower body. Unfortunately, the technology is expensive, even for your family, and when he filled out an application to the Hero Public Safety Commission to help pay, they rejected it, Izuku paused to let that sink in. Why would they do that? Iida asked. He wanted to refuse this boy's claims, but the proof was right there in his hand. He saw the application and immediately recognized his brother Tensei's signature. Well normally the HPSC would help severely injured heroes with medical expenses. That is as long as the medical procedures will eventually lead to said person's return to their hero profession, Izuku explained the lesser known policies of the government. Your brother Tensei's exo legs would only have given him the ability to walk again as the technology has, yet to get to the stage where he could go back to being a hero. So they deemed him useless just like everyone in the world deemed quickless people like me useless and discarded us like trash to be forgotten and unnoticed. Izuku handed the shaking taller boy the tablet, so he could read through it all himself. Do you want to know what they used the money that they could have used on Tensei for? 
Not long after his request was denied the hero Endeavor, in a fight against a group of villains, burned down a lot of businesses in the crossfire. They spent more money on paying off the business owners, buying their silence and compliance, than what they could have used giving your brother some of his mobility and dignity back. How did you find all this out? Nida was furious with the way the HPSC discarded his heroic older brother, but he needed to know how Midoriya came by such information. You're talking to the director of the hero regulation department, Izuku chuckled with pride. Once I gained my position I was granted legal access to all the classified files. All the dirty little secrets the HPSC tried to keep out of the public to make the heroes look clean are now at my fingertips. How could they be so callous? Nida collapsed to his knees as his hands tightened around the screen. There it is, Izuku kneeled down with him. He placed his gauntlet-covered hand on the other boy's shoulder. Now you finally see what's wrong. Corruption. Heroes are not heroes and those who are weak or useless don't matter in this world. Taking the tablet from Ida's hands he continued. I reopened your brother's application just last week. With me backing it, he'll get those exo legs and soon be able to walk again. And who knows, maybe if a certain director with a few connections and influence could hire a couple scientists to advance the technology in a few years, we could perhaps see the return of the turbo hero Ingenium. Ida's teary eyes snapped up to look at the green-haired teen. Why are you doing this? To make me join you. Tania wanted so badly to believe that Midoriya was a villain at heart that would stoop so low. He really wished he could write him off as that. It would be so less complicated. Of course not. Tensei will be helped whether you agree to join me or not, Izuku shrugged as he stood back up. It's your choice, he gestured to the open space behind him. You walk out of here and be done with all of this. I wouldn't hold it against you. I just wanted to see a great hero like Ingenium be given what he is rightfully owed. What about your crimes? All the horrible things you've done all in the name of this new better society you envision. Ida inquired as he too went back up on his feet. Tania, I'll confess, I do get great satisfaction in punishing corrupt heroes, Izuku admitted. I'm only human, therefore I'm flawed. I did enjoy it greatly to see the look on All Might's face when I revealed his lies to the world, Izuku sighed as he looked away. I had to do a lot of terrible things to get where I am today. Some of it I loved, but other things like hurting my mother and causing your rocket to get expelled I regret with all my heart, Izuku gave him a pleading look. I'm not going to lie, reforming this hero-controlled society is going to be a messy affair, and I can't do it all by myself. That's why I need your help. I need a Chako and Shoto. As much as you detest Stain I need him too, that includes Dobby and Toga as well, he held his right hand out in front of Tania. This is going to be a group effort, so Tania Iida, will you be a part of it or not? On one hand Izuku Midoriya had a point about what was wrong with society and heroes, but there had to be other methods to fix it. All this violence and robbing people of their quirks was just wrong, no matter what angle you looked at. Midoriya wanted revenge against the society, that rejected him that much was clear to Iida, and this is how the boy planned to get that revenge. To the young hero, in training it didn't matter how the other teen tried to justify himself for he knew in his heart that Midoriya was wrong about how he wanted to go about this change. It was then that Tania got an idea in his head. While well, Izuka couldn't be stopped physically and politically, what if instead he was taken down from within his own organization? At the very least he could supply people like Aizawa and All Might information on the inner workings of Midoriya's department. Perhaps he could even find out how the gauntlet worked and its potential weaknesses. With that they might be able to stop him once and for all. Perhaps Tania could even convince Shoto and Ichako to see reason as well with enough time. I can't let an opportunity like this go, Iida thought as he reached out to shake Midoriya's offered hand. Alright I'll see where this goes, but if something happens, that I don't agree with then I'm out. He was fully committing to the role of teen convinced to another's side of ideology. I can agree to those terms. It's not like you're under contract or anything, Izuka laughed believing that he had finally won Iida over. The president of class 1 retained his serious face, but on the inside his head he was already swarming with concerns. He had no idea what the future held now or what would become of him should this plan backfire, but for now it was the best shot he had. Thanks for listening. I do hope you enjoyed. If you want a next part of this video, like subscribe and comment down below and turn on that bell notification and also check out the other videos that I have created and enjoy. See you in the next video. Peace.